This is Jeffrey Geisner, founder of the Jewish Culture and Holocaust, October 7, Remembrance and the Against Hate International Communities. Thanks for joining us for our September 2024 International Film Festival program entitled One Way Out, Work. Today's International Film Festival presentation also features our special guest presenter, multiple book author, and Lodge Ghetto history expert, Mark H. Newhouse. His award-winning book, Trilogy, The Devil's Bookkeepers, is based on his research of the Lodge Ghetto. Along with testimony from a chronicle of the Lodge Ghetto Diary, discovered buried in a box with other books after Mark's parents passed, this diary was the basis of his Devil's Book Eper trilogy. Mark H. Newhouse is, is a longtime educator and was the recipient of the Elementary Secondary Teacher of the Year Award by the New York State Reading Association in New York, New York, USA. Currently, Mark is retired and actively writing and speaking about the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. You can find more about Mark and his family publishing company at newhousecreativegroup.com. Mark H. Newhouse has presented many of his stories to the Jewish culture and Holocaust October 7, remembrance audiences, and is a close friend. You will certainly enjoy Mark's engaging interview. The Devil's Bookkeepers Trilogy is available on Amazon along with his many other terrific books. A word of caution, the subject matter in this film is for mature audiences. The photos, video, recordings, music, pictures, and content of this film may be disturbing to some who suffer, like I do, from intergenerational survivor trauma or PTSD disorders. As a second-generation survivor, I am very cautious about selecting the content for this film. It is nothing you have not seen before. Please help us by subscribing to the YouTube channel for Jewish Culture and Holocaust October 7. Remembrance so you will be automatically notified of the new on-demand films released weekly. Jeffrey Geisner produces each film. Please share this film widely with your family and friends, both Jewish and none. We all must do our part to push back against Holocaust denial and stand against hate. Enjoy today's on-demand film, The Way Out. Work the Lodge Ghetto. I can hear cannons, and I can see fire in the sky to the south. The war is so near. Ludge will be taken any moment. Our neighbor insists we should leave. Run away as far as we can. Leave everything to get away. His wife is crying, but where can we go? Panic. Throngs leaving their homes. My mother talks Mrs. Grabinski out of her ridiculous plans to flee. Other neighbors come. More Jews seeking advice. Someone says everyone should run so the enemy won't send us off to work camps. My father doesn't know what to do. He runs to my uncle, and then uncle back to father. They've decided. We're going to stay. We will not run. Friday, September 8th, 1939. German patrols are moving on Pietrakowska Street. Ludge is occupied. Their faces are like Martians. The Conquerors. Damn them.
our local Germans greeted their countrymen. Civilians, even boys and girls, are jumping into the passing military cars with the happy Heil Hitler. Whatever was hidden in the past now shows its true face. Confidential. Strictly secret. To the Regierungspräsident in Kalish. Jews must be placed in a closed ghetto. I will fix the date when the establishment of the ghetto will suddenly take place. At the set hour, the previously defined border of the ghetto will be manned by forces assigned for this purpose. The streets will be closed off by barbed wire barriers and other blocking devices. We must succeed in drawing out all the valuables squirreled away by the Jews. It is obvious that the establishment of the ghetto is only a transitional measure. I reserve for myself the decision of when and by what means the city of Lodz will be cleansed of Jews. In any case, the final aim must be to burn out entirely this pestilent abscess. Ubelhor. March 16th, 1940. Bloody Thursday. A pogrom in Lodz. Jewish tenants in the big apartment building on Piotrkovska Street are ordered to leave their apartments in 15 minutes. Anyone found inside is simply shot. A hundred people are killed. We run for our lives to the filthy and narrow streets of the renowned Baluti slum. During the Holocaust, the creation of ghettos was a key step in the German process of brutally separating, persecuting, and ultimately destroying Europe's Jews. It's important to understand that the Germans saw the ghettos as a provisional measure to control, segregate the Jews, while the Nazi leadership back in Berlin would think of, you know, options on how to remove the Jewish population altogether. I'm standing here today in front of this incredible monument at Radogost Station, or Radegast. I'm gonna to talk to you about a ghetto, a very important ghetto, the second biggest ghetto just after the Warsaw Ghetto. It's called the Wuch Ghetto, or Litzmannstadt Ghetto. Did you know that at the beginning of the war, 34% of which 630,000 inhabitants at the time were Jewish? If you do the math, that comes out to around 220,000 people. So that means that this city was a very important cultural hub for the Jewish population. The Germans took over Wuj on the 8th of September of 1939, and the city was then renamed Litzmannstadt in honor of a, some general, General Karl von Litzmann, who had fought a battle near the city during World War I. In February of 1940, the creation of a Jewish ghetto in the northern edge of the city of Wuj was created. The Jews were forced to wear a yellow badge, their businesses were expropriated by the Gestapo, and after the invasion of Poland, many Jews, particularly the intellectual and political elite, had fled into the Soviet-occupied eastern Poland. And on the 30th of April 1940, 
The territory of the ghetto was closed off. 164,000 Jews from all over which were closed off into an area of just four kilometers. There was this mistaken belief that productivity was the key to Jewish survival beyond the Holocaust. And uh, there was a very dominant figure named Chaim Rumkowski who tried to ensure that the labor productivity in the ghetto was as high as possible and that all the prisoners that were capable of working were doing so to their maximum capacity. They were, of course, being just used for cheap labor and in the end, their destiny was going to be met inside one of those carriages, old cattle carriages that would depart from this station to the different extermination camps that were set up around Poland. The ages of the people that were being exploited inside the ghetto ranged from just barely 10 years old all the way to 65. But you might ask, then what happened to the children? What happened to the elderly? The Germans, <laughs> they were not, they were not tossing anything away. They had plans for everything. They had very macabre plans for everything and every single person. On the 28th of November of 1942, a camp for Polish children was opened. The official name of this camp was the Security Police Litzmannstadt Isolation Camp for Polish Youth. Think about how disturbing that is. A camp created solely for, for children. Over 1,000 children lived there, separated from their families, working more than eight hours a day. They were fed very small rations of food that would starve them almost to death. They had very little water, practically no heating. The conditions were horrendous. But this was not just the children. This was generalized. Around 25% of the ghetto population, that's around 45,000 people, died of malnutrition and cold, and of course, diseases. From January 1942, deportations flowed from the ghetto on this very train station, the Radega station. They will be transported to nearby Helmno, a city that is about 50 kilometers north of Wuc, where prisoners were killed in mobile gas chambers at the Helmno extermination camp. In the second wave of deportations in September of 1942, almost 20,000 prisoners were murdered, mostly children, old people, and the sick. Few months you had the list to come to the station, and from there people went straight to death camps. We didn't know it because the ghetto was completely isolated. We didn't have any contact with with the external world. World. So uh, now the question we, we didn't know, but. Um, the question is, so what happened with the people? We never got a letter from them, nothing. So we didn't, I was in the ghetto, you know, hungry, and, 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 uh, and, I, and, and I see people disappearing, and I, we don't know where. It was hard even to believe that the people were killed. May 18, 1944, František Brozna. 14 years old, perished in Auschwitz, December 15, 1943. Eva 15 years old, perished in Auschwitz, October 4, 1944. I was taken away on Saturday morning, the whole story around it, surrounded by dogs, Gestapo, Kripa, you know what Kripa is, criminal police, every Jew was considered a criminal. What was the crime? He's alive. 
I was taken away from Lodge a few months before the liquidation. The liquidation is a euphemistic, it means killing, that's it. The Germans created a special language. They never said, I will kill you or I will shoot you. No, I will lay you down. Liquidation meant killing. Gazing, Arbeit, so it's a special language. I was taken away March the 4th, 1944, from my family, never to see them again. And because I was taken away, I survived. If they, the Germans didn't send me out from the ghetto, I would have shared the same lot as my family did. And I started to study the date. The date must contain a message. And I'm not a mystic, I'm a rational guy. But if I find something that can help me, I became mystical. And doing it for self, self-preservation, that's it. They sent me away March the 4th. It must have a message. March 4th. Don't stop. Don't give up. So this, if if they they sent me away March the 10th, I would have found another, but, but I tried to hold on to something to justify the reason why I, I survived. I'm Keith Newhouse, co-founder of Newhouse Creative Group. I'm honored today to have been asked to interview someone very special to me. I'll be interviewing him about his experience as the child of Holocaust survivors of the Ludge Ghetto and his multi-award winning book series, The Devil's Bookkeepers, based on the Ludge Ghetto. Now it's my pleasure to introduce my dad, Mark Newhouse. Thank you very much for being here with me. So dad, what was the Ludge Ghetto? Keith. When I was young, my parents spoke about the Ludge Ghetto with their friends in Yiddish and Polish. And I had to pick up little scraps. So honestly, I thought it was like Fiddler on the Roofs and Tefka. I thought it was a village in Poland where Jews lived in peace for many generations. I was really shocked to learn there was only a three square mile sealed off section of the industrial city of Ludge that was established by the Nazis in February of 1940 as a corral for Jews. People may know a little bit about the Warsaw Ghetto because of its uprising that took place from April 19th to May 16th, 
1943. The story of the lunch ghetto is really much less known, but very, very compelling. It was a, a hermetically sealed slum surrounded by barbed wire, rifle-toting Nazi sentries, and Nazified Polish people. It was a deadly holding tank for more than 250,000 Jews who had no idea of its purpose. I want you to imagine a leader who was appointed by the Germans, but who brutally enforced their decrees and then forged the ghetto into an industrial hub, even making goods for the German military. His name was Chaim Romkowski, and you have to wonder how far he would go. He wanted to save hundreds and thousands of Jews as the Nazi noose tightened around him. The question is, was Romkowski a savior or a collaborator, the devil? I wonder what we would do in his place. And I also wonder how my parents survived when so many did not. These were the questions that inspired me to write the award-winning historical fiction called The Devil's Bookkeepers, which followed the true events of the ghetto. It was a story I needed to share, so it never happens again to anyone anywhere. So what was life like in Ludge for the Jews before the invasion of Poland? Um, Ludge was a very powerful industrial city in Poland with approximately 250,000 Jews. That was about 34% of the population of the city. It was the second largest concentration of Jews in Europe. And many owned textile mills and factories that employed the Polish citizens. So they felt as if the Polish people were their friends and they were protected from Hitler. The sad thing is only 877 survived. When exactly did the Nazis occupy Ludge and create the ghetto? Well, Hitler invaded Ludge in the September of 1939. Uh, the ghetto was established in February of 1940 as a temporary solution to the Jewish problem. On March 16, 1940, thousands of Jews were driven into the ghetto on what was called Bloody Sunday. They were given 15 minutes to gather their things. Uh, 100 Jews were killed, mostly shot. Uh, my mother's family was included in this panicky rush into the ghetto, as was my father's. The survivors were crammed into this three square mile slum, sealed in by barbed wire and armed German sentries. Nazified Poles and Germans made the ghetto unique, Keith, because it was surrounded. It was basically a hermetically sealed holding tank. On November 8th, 1940, the Germans changed the name of the ghetto from Ludge to Litzmannstadt, named after a famous German general. Many thought this symbolized how Hitler valued the manufacturing uh, ability of the ghetto for the war effort, and that that would protect them. So how is the ghetto governed? Well, the ghetto was governed in the beginning by the, what they call the Judenrat, which was like most ghettos, a council of elders. The Germans, for some reason, promoted M.C. Romkowski, Heim Romkowski, to be their leader. Nobody seems to know why. He was over 60 years old. He was born in Russia, not even in Lodge, and had fifth grade education. All the power was in his control. He established a Jewish police force and, you know, Keith, he crushed any resistance that he argued could invite German interference. He believed that he could forge the Jews into a vital manufacturer. And if he could do that, the ghetto would be left alone. Was he the savior of my parents, of your grandparents, or was he the self-protecting collaborator, the devil, as many brand him even today? He's a highly controversial historical figure. He helped the Nazis, even to the point of deporting Jews to the death camps. Nobody knows when he became aware of the final destination of the Jews he sent out of the Ludge Ghetto. 
He authorized the Chronicle of the Lodge Ghetto because he said that he knew someday he would be judged. In my novels, I leave it to the readers to judge him. How did the ghetto change over its existence? Well, I think you have to understand that Jews were an essential part of the Ludge industrial and cultural society. Their factories employed many Polish people. They were shocked when the Germans, with the help of Polish residents, brutally chased them into this worst section of Ludge. They were crammed into three square miles with dilapidated buildings without electricity and heat. How water forget about? It's really difficult to ascertain when Ronkowski and the Jews in the ghetto knew where the mounting numbers of deportees he selected were sent. On January 3rd, 1942, the serious deportation started. Uh, he attempted to crush rumors about the fate of the Jews that the Nazis said were being sent to northern farmlands. The Germans even forged postcards to calm the residents and to convince them that the people who left were in much better shape than those in the ghetto. The actual liquidation of the ghetto began in February of 1944, and the last entry of the Chronicle was July 31, 1944, when the last Jews from the ghetto were sent to Auschwitz. The Ludge Jewish administration of that ghetto lasted for 1,296 days. It was the longest lasting of all the ghettos. Was Ronkowski correct? As he said, history still has to judge him. What kinds of hardship did Ludge ghetto residents endure? Keith, you name it. When we think of the Holocaust, you know, we tend to focus on the extermination camps, the mass shootings, the mechanized mass murders in the gas chambers of the final solution. As I researched for my novels, I came to understand that the ghettos were the original Nazi death traps. Their weapons were cold, hunger, thirst, disease, terror, and despair. Death and deportation were swords hanging over everyone every single day. The Star of David, which had been once a source of pride, had to be worn on the chest and back of every outfit. There were battles over things like potato peels, cigarettes, spoiled vegetables, scraps of wood. They were desperate for wood for heat. Crime was rampant. Desperate people you know, do desperate things. The people were like skeletons, forced to make supplies for the German military. Cleanliness, impossible. Diseases such as typhus, tuberculosis, and cholera were rampant, and there were hardly any doctors and medicines. The Germans raided the hospitals and they executed the patients from time to time. Anyone who could not work was not worth feeding. And fear and uncertainty were constants. Many committed suicide rather than face another day like this. There was one other weapon that was more insidious that the Germans used. It was hope. The Germans instilled hope to placate the trapped souls. It was similar to the infamous Auschwitz sign, Arbit macht free, work will make you free. The Germans exploited hope to keep the ghetto working with minimal use of their military. And Ronkowski, he enforced every order. On September 4th, 1942, the residents faced their greatest ordeal when they were gathered in town square, hoping to hear some good news. And Ronkowski gave his famous speech, fathers and mothers, give me your children. Keith, had I been born a few years earlier, I would not be here today. You would not have been born. What surprised you as you researched and wrote your book? You know, just about everything. My early life was filled with mysteries. You know, when we went to dinner, a bris of our mitzvah or another celebration, I always wondered why mom and her wealthy friends carried 
aluminum foil in their handbags. I was kind of embarrassed when suddenly they'd scoop up food from the table. I always wondered if other children were told if they did not eat the last kuskula, that tiny crumb of bread or food on the plate, all the children of Europe would starve. I knew my parents were different because they and their friends sounded, they sound like Russian spies, Keith. You know what they sounded like. Some had numbers tattooed on their arms. Later, I learned that they were all Holocaust survivors from this exotic place called the Ludge Ghetto. Unfortunately, my parents never really provided the details. They hardly ever spoke about it. What little I gleaned, mostly from Polish and Yiddish, gave me terrible nightmares. So honestly, I didn't ask the questions. Before mom passed away, she gave me a monster of a book. And I put it in my closet and I forgot about it. But after mom died, I discovered it was a signed copy of the Chronicle of the Ledge Ghetto. I didn't even know it existed. I was so surprised that I sat on the floor and I started reading it. And the entries were all written anonymously in the same building as the German ghetto administration. It gave me the first clear picture of what my parents and 250,000 human beings suffered. Keith, I, I never heard of their leader, Heim Romkowski, and I was shocked by his drastic actions. But I asked myself what I would have done in his place. That's what readers do as they read my books. I was haunted by what I learned and what I had not known. So I decided I needed to share the history with my, with you, uh, with Josh and my grandchildren. I had won awards as a children's book writer, but I, I didn't think I could do this incredible story justice. I was really shocked when book one was honored with several major awards. I'm really proud and moved by the thousands of emotional reader reviews from all over the world that tell me people are learning about the true events and the amazing characters that survived and some that did not survive the Ludge Ghetto. What makes your books different than the many about the Holocaust? Well, you're right. There are a lot of books about the Holocaust. And of course, I recommend reading the Chronicle of the Ludge Ghetto, which was translated and edited by Luke John Dobrzycki, but can never pronounce his name, published by Yale University Press in 1984 and other primary sources. Um, I relied on them to make my novels as authentic as possible, which is, I think, one of the things that people comment about. My story of love and sacrifice keeps readers awake at night. I try to provide human faces and suspense, suspenseful stories to bring the ghetto to life. My hope is that encourages people to learn more about the Ludge Ghetto. As a teacher, I found a good story is the most effective way to excite people to learn more. Readers become engaged in the story and characters, and they want to learn about the true events. My story is one that they say they won't forget. And I think my books humanize the Holocaust and show Jews not as sheep accepting their slaughter, but as real people who cherish life and love. As one reviewer wrote, quote, the devil's bookkeepers is a tribute to the human immutable spirit. I kind of think of it as a tribute to my parents, all survivors and victims of the Holocaust and genocide past, present, and unfortunately future. You know, if you read the reviews, you'll grab the books. As another reviewer wrote, you can't read The Devil's Bookkeepers and not be moved. What were your own parents like? Oh boy, that's a tough one. I knew almost nothing. And to this day, I don't know very much about my father's childhood and his family. I do know he was an only child. 
Um, I modeled one of my main characters after him because he was a mystery to me most of my life. He was very brave, outspoken, and what we call a dry cook. That means a shrewdy. He was strict, very strict, and he had a volatile temper that made him difficult to live with, as you know. He was driven to success, and he instilled that in my brother and me. Now, mom had six brothers and sisters, which I did not know about. Only one brother and sister survived. I never met my grandparents on either side. I was born two years after mom was freed from Auschwitz in a displaced persons camp in Germany. My parents married to escape Europe. A baby, me, put them ahead of the line. So I was their passport. When they came to New York in August of 1947, they had $5 from the Jewish agency. They were placed in a Bronx tenement where they struggled as new immigrants. Uh, they had to earn money. They had to repay their loans. They had to learn English. And quite honestly, they had a terrible stormy marriage. My father became a ragman, Keith, just like Kirk Douglas's father was. And within a few years, he owned his own warehouse, trucks, and a luxury apartment in Whitestone, Queens. We did have plastic covers on our couches, though. Do you remember them? My father was extremely authoritarian, and he, he even fought mom when she wanted to learn how to drive and go to work. Finally, after 20 years, mom divorced him, and she ended up owning a travel agency. 20 years later, she married a very kind man who also happened to be a survivor from Sosnovich, Poland. My father married again, but he divorced 20 years later after having two more children. My parents drilled into our heads this drive to excel in school and in our careers. I think one reason they did that was they believed another Holocaust would happen. So we needed to be prepared. And they thought even in the United States, we were not safe. So what happened to the lunch ghetto, Dad? You really want me to give away the ending of my novels. Okay. Ronkowski's strategy was to turn the ghetto into producer for the German military. And you know what? It appeared to be working. Just to give you one example, he was initially able to lower the numbers demanded for the deportations by arguing with the Nazis that the factories could not function with fewer man manpower, with less manpower. Even young children were forced to work to save them. I think that may have saved my parents and explains why my father kept changing his birth date. We never knew which was his real birthday. The Jews of the ghetto were sealed off from the rest of the world. So they did not have any suspicion of the final deportation destination of the deportees. It's really unclear when Rumkowski knew, but truckloads of soiled clothing and shoes without heels and souls were secretly stored in Romkowski's warehouses, a, a very important first clue. The Germans countered the terrifying rumors of the deportees' fate by sending forged postcards, allegedly from northern farmlands, to the Ludge ghetto to prevent uprisings that occurred in other ghettos, such as in the Warsaw ghetto. But Romkowski's complicity reached its height with his give me your children speech and the forced deportation of children. The deportees were taken by trucks or marched to the train station and loaded on the infamous cattle cars. What was the population of the ghetto? You know, no one seems to know exactly. But the figures vary from approximately 250,000 at its peak to 877 survivors left there to clean up at the end of the war. We do know 45% starved to death. Almost all the residents were Jews with a few converted spouses. How many were sent to concentration camps? Which ones were they sent to? Well, the main camps were held no, and later the far more efficient Auschwitz. After January of 1942, trains ran back and forth from Auschwitz on a regular basis. The Germans kept a skeleton crew to clean up the evidence. 
and grave diggers were among the last to remain. Can you guess why? Well, the Germans were terrified of disease. If the bodies were not removed, they were afraid the disease would become much more serious than it already was. The head researcher at the Holocaust Museum uh, thought that my father may have worked as a grave digger, which may have saved him and also inspired a scene in my novel. Where were your parents, my grandparents, sent? <laughs> well, your grandparents were sent to Auschwitz, but thankfully near the end of the war. My father once described being on a line before Dr. Mengele, who was also called the Angel of Death. He was later sent to Buchenwald. Mom and one sister survived Auschwitz. What amazes me is to think about what they and the others sacrificed because of irrational hate might have accomplished had they lived. How did grandma and grandpa survive? That's a good question. My parents never really talked much about the Holocaust, Keith, so we only have some clues as to how they survived. If you remember, your grandma was only five feet tall and extremely petite, but she was so gutsy. In her 80s, she did a tape for Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation and revealed that she worked in a warehouse where she was taught to run her hands uh, over clothing and turn over any valuables that she found. My guess is that that saved her. The head researcher at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. believes that my father may have worked at some point as a grave digger, which saved him since, as I said, the Germans were so afraid of disease. Unfortunately, both your grandparents died without sharing how they survived when so many did not. To be honest, I feel guilty about losing that very important legacy for my children and my grandchildren. I wish I'd asked more questions. What was it like being the child of survivors? Very different than from my friends. I felt lonely with gra without grandparents and family like most of my friends. I think that's why I started writing. My father was a perfectionist and extremely strict. He believed in his heart that there would be another Holocaust and it would even take place in America. And the only way for us to survive would be to get top grades in school and earn money. The Holocaust was a constant shadow in my life, but we knew so little about the details. So what I imagined made it even scarier that, than it would have been if they had talked to me. I really didn't understand why my family was so different and what drove my parents so insistently towards survival and towards success. How do you think your books help others? Well, I hope they really do, because my books for children and adults show how we can overcome adversity and solve problems, not by magic or violence, but by intelligence, courage, and caring. The Devil's Bookkeeper's novels, they're not about gas chambers and dying, but about living and loving and friendship. I think they declare, even in the worst of times, that we have humor, and yes, there's humor there, love, and perhaps the most important thing, hope. The Ludge Ghetto was a nightmare, but people clung to their friendships, to love, and they held on to their dreams. Learning about the Ludge Ghetto, I think readers asked what they would do if they were Romkowski or the protagonist Ostrovsky trying to save his young wife and child. They see Singer, who I modeled after my father, as a man who is confronted by his demons and must decide whether to rise above them. I think we need the questions to find answers as to what is happening now all over the world today. I hope that my books bring those questions to life and promote, th you know, thinking and caring. How has the Holocaust affected your own life? Well, I never felt normal like other kids. They had grandparents and they had photos of relatives. We had none. I almost had no family and we discovered a few photographs after my parents were gone. My father and mother were immigrants who lost everything. 
The Holocaust was always in our home. It made me very sensitive to any prejudice, hate, discrimination, and bullying. I think that's one of the things that made me popular with my with my students when I was teaching, uh, building tolerance and empowering people to overcome obstacles are underlying themes for my teaching and my books. Most importantly, like Anne Frank, I believe most people are good. And I think that's what my book, my books deal with that idea that most people are good. What advice do you have to counter anti-Semitism and hate? You know, I had to deal with hate and bullying as a classroom teacher. And I think a lot of what we do in school may be temporarily effective, but wears off after a while. What I think we should do is integrate positive programs into every aspect of education. The Holocaust, for example, needs to be taught as the prime example of what happens when hate goes unchecked and is state sponsored and not as an isolated historical event from the past. Isolating Holocaust, Holocaust instruction risks it being relegated to the distant past as a historical footnote and only important to the Jewish population. We need not to just to preach to the choir, but to universalize it within all programs that deal with countering hate and tolerance. The Holocaust, in my opinion, must not be seen as a bump in the Jewish road, but as a major event whose impact lasted, is lasting, and will impact the future all over the globe. Even you, Keith, have been affected you know, as a grandchild of Holocaust survivors. Any last words you'd like to share? Yeah, of course. I never run out of words. Thank you, Jeffrey, and everyone who cares so much about promoting love and countering hate that you were here today. I believe educating our young people is the only way we'll create a world where everyone is respected and safe. I am honored to be included in this effort. I hope learning about the Ludge Ghetto helps people understand what too many are suffering in our troubled world today. That's why I wrote the books, and that is why I think the books have universal themes that reach out to everyone who reads them. Where are your books available, Dad? Oh, thank you for asking. The Devil's Bookkeepers is available in paperback, ebook, and absolutely amazing audio books from Amazon, Kindle, and other online outlets. You can learn about my other books and order signed sets or obtain discounts for group orders from www.newhousecreativegroup.com. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my story. Please preserve your story. Every one of you has one. It's the greatest gift you can give your family. I still feel very guilty about not being able to tell you, Keith, how our parent, how your grandparents survived when so many did not. Thanks, Keith, for doing this. Extermination camps were instruments of terror. Horrendous things would happen there. Criminal medical experiments. And these camps were the brainchild of two of the most vile people that have ever walked this earth. Of course, Heinrich Himmler and Hermann Goering. At the beginning of 1944, the Germans decided to close the ghetto. And then they sent off the remaining people that were there to the nearby extermination camps of Helmno and Auschwitz. Right here, right here behind me, you see a very interesting monument. These are death camps. Stutthof, Kumhof am Neer. We see Auschwitz Birkenau. They are represented here in this monument because many of the prisoners were transported from the Wuch ghetto directly to these camps. The shape of this monument, as you can see here, uh, symbolizes the Jewish tombs called Matzeva or Masiba. In Polish, I think it's Matzev. They mean sacred pillar. It is used for a headstone or a tombstone marking a Jewish grave. Oh, 
August 28 of 2005, a monument commemorating the Jewish victims and all of the victims who passed through the Radga station was unveiled. Based on the designs of Czesław Bielecki and featuring a 140 meter tunnel called the Tunnel of the Departed now stands tall, helping us not to forget the past. These are the original tracks this is the original station where so many people were sent off.
Jeffrey Geisner, founder of the Jewish Culture and Holocaust, October 7th, Remembrance and Stand Against Hate Communities, is back with you again. I hope you both enjoyed today's two documentary films, The Way Out, Work, and The Photographer. Both focus on the deportation, final liquidation, and murder of more than 225,000 Jews from the Lodz Ghetto. I hope you also took away new learning and insights as I did while researching the film. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel to be immediately notified of new releases. Please help me share this free on-demand film widely with your friends and family and on your social networks. We all must work harder to stand against hate. Thanks again to our guest presenter and author of The Devil's Bookkeeper, Mark H. Newhouse. The Devil's Bookkeeper trilogy and his son, Keith Newhouse, are also members and friends of our community. You can find Mark's and his other fine books on Amazon. We conclude today's program with a musical reflection for our brothers and sisters in Israel, the hostages in captivity, the brave IDF soldiers fighting for all of us, the innocents in Gaza and the Middle East, Sich zu wie mir singen, wie es klappen unsere Herze mit Rhythm von Eier leben, herzig zu. Wir seinen Eierkinder, wir singen Eierlieder, so lieb euch mir seinen Dorf. We are here because of you. We'll tell your story, live your dreams, and sing your song. With courage, faith, and hope, with voices proud and strong. The world will know your life, your love, your legacy lives on. Herzig zu, we will remember you. You're with us everywhere we go. We hold you safely in our hearts. We'll share with future generations all the lessons of your past, all your suffering and losses and the pain that you've been through will never be forgotten. Herzig zu. We'll tell your story, live your dreams and sing your song with courage, faith and hope with voices proud and strong. The world will know your life, your love, your legacy lives on. Herzig zu, we will remember you. We have cried in all our tears the sadness of your darkest years, but the joy in your survival gives us life. Mir wollen euch kein Mal nicht vergessen, mir wollen euch ständig gedenken. Euf Ebeck will mir singen, zu lieb euch. We'll tell your story, live your dreams and sing your song. With courage, faith and hope, with voices proud and strong. The world will know your life, your love. Your legacy lives on, herzig zu, we will remember you, herzig zu.